retained, not only for our case, but for everybody. And that's, I think, a role that we, the countries of the third world, the countries of the south, have to play. You mentioned the north, you mentioned the countries of the south, you mentioned the, uh, the developing countries, but you have somehow not mentioned non-aligned club. Do you find that the non-aligned is a diminishing club in some ways? Well, Cyprus is proud to have been one of the founding members of the non-aligned movement, and uh, I, uh, my presidency started with the very successful non-aligned foreign ministers conference in Cyprus in '88. Uh, I think the non-alignment, uh, the non-aligned movement, certainly at this moment is is going through a transitional period. Uh, talking to a friend uh, the other day, I was saying that. Uh, uh, it reminds me of the famous Pirandello play of uh, six actors in search of a role. Uh, you could say that the non-aligned movement is in search of a role. Because we must not forget the historical background to the non-aligned movement. It started as a non-aligned movement. Now, to be non-aligned, that means there is something to which you don't want to be aligned. And in those days, we were the two blocks. And it was uh, when countries, particularly like Yugoslavia, for example, in those days, was pressurized to be aligned, said, please, let me be free and non-aligned. And the same was true for India and for uh, much lesser extent in that sense for Cyprus, but anyway, way for all the other founding members of the non-aligned movement. As long as the world was divided into two blocks, it was easy to see a role for the non-aligned movement. Uh, the two blocks are now over. We know that. Uh, the Cold War is over. So you could as well say that the non-aligned movement has fulfilled its historical uh, role and has no reason to exist. Uh, it would have been nice if this is, it was so. It would have been nice if, uh, as Mr. Fukuyama said, that would have been the end of the history. But the history cannot end uh, so easily. Uh, and. Uh, Yes, there are no blocks to which the developing countries need to be or not to be aligned. But there are many, many other problems. First of all, practically all non-aligned countries, with exceptions of countries like US, India, and uh, some other important countries, are both economically and uh, geographically, militarily weak countries, small countries. And uh, the problem of security is very important for them. Uh, secondly, security is not only security in military sense. Security is in political terms, but it's also more important in economic terms. And, uh, and with few exceptions, the non-aligned world is, the, is uh, the synonymous with the South, which means economically weak. And there, uh, there is a huge task to fulfill. How to promote cooperation between uh, the countries of the non-aligned world, how to help these countries have a voice. Uh, therefore, the name may be historically meaningless today, because there are no blocks to be or not to be aligned to, but the substance in the sense that uh, we wanted a non-aligned movement to be a movement of uh, countries that uh, wanted to be free, to be politic, to be neutral in terms of conflicts of ideologies, and to be able to pursue their uh, path of development, uh, it's very important. So uh, it is up to us, up to the countries of the non-aligned movement to try and, uh, and find a role, redefine the role, and do that consistently, and then help make that into a reality. And since the what is common in our problems and in, in our efforts to achieve this is much more important than what probably divides us or differences that may exist. I think uh, we have 
plenty of things to do and a role for the non-aligned movement, but, but it is up to us to do it. Just as you said that the non-aligned are in search of a new role, similarly a structure like NATO is also in search of a new role because with the collapse of Soviet power, uh, NATO has to find another role. Do you think a new role is being found for NATO in, this, in the context of the new conflict that we have in your vicinity in the Gulf? Not necessarily. I think there, I am certain that in 10 years from now, if there is NATO, it will be very different from what is today. Uh, because don't forget that uh, we have the CSC conference, the, new, the need for a new security arrangement within the CSC, and uh, this is going to be a very important factor in, in the future. And uh, once you in that, CNC is CSC, the, the, you know, the, the Helsinki process. Oh, the Helsinki process, yes. The Helsinki right, right, process, right. The, uh, which yeah. with the Paris uh, right. summit which we had. I mean, the, the need for, uh, for collective security in Europe, which is much more important now than ever before, because you have all the uh, European countries, the Central and Eastern European countries, that feel very badly the need for new security arrangements. And this is a role that cannot be fulfilled by NATO. Uh, so that is a need. And at the same time, uh, you cannot speak of NATO in the Gulf. As a matter of fact, the alliance that takes place in, in uh, in the Gulf War is, is anything but NATO. It's, there are non-aligned countries in it, there are uh, countries members of NATO in it and countries that are not members. So it will change. But the Germans have expressed fear that NATO might get involved in this conflict. Well, I don't think that from now on this is really the case because the NATO countries have on their own, either they, in that sense, they are involved. Germany, uh, France, England, uh, United States, Canada, Italy—they are, they are involved. So, not as a group, but the horizontal escalation of this conflict. Israel might get involved, might retaliate. Uh, Turkey is half there. Um, Iran is making noises. Uh, how do you see this widening conflict? Where is it likely to end? you having a ringside seat, as it were. I'm worried about the conflict as such, and uh, I hope that it can be brought to an end as quickly as possible. Which form of escalation will take place, that is secondary, as we want the conflict to end. By horizontal conflict, I meant um, any day Israel may be provoked to retaliate uh, retaliation is one thing, and involvement. I don't think that Israel will uh, will decide to get involved directly. They know very, they see very well and very clearly that it is better for them not to get involved. So you don't fear any? Do you, uh, Iranians, the Turks? Certain. No, I, I'm not. Uh, I do not think that there is anybody who wants to get bombed at this moment. I, I don't think that. I don't think. That's the way we should look at it, that uh, it's going to be expanded. Uh, and anyway, it's dramatic enough as it is not to want to see it expand in any way. How do you explain Turkey's role in the, in the conflict at this point? Well, Turkey is, is uh, from a neighbor of Iraq, and therefore it had a role to play. Um, there are American bases on Turkey that are now being used against Iraq. And Turkey, at least the Turkish president, has made the conscious choice that uh, they said they want to support the Allied effort uh, in the case of Kuwait. The only problem for Turkey is that uh, there is a moral weakness here. You cannot say that you are fighting or you want to contribute to the implementation of Security Council resolutions for Kuwait, but at the same time you want to fight and to contribute for the non-implementation of Security Council resolutions on Cyprus. And that is a, a real problem for them. Uh, and I think that the main, uh, therefore I cannot easily accept uh, 
words like that they are doing that on high moral principles. I think it is very much uh, uh, specific benefits as they envisage them. But uh, I would be quite happy to hear the Turkish leadership say that they're fighting on moral grounds because then they would have to implement them on Cyprus as well. What specific advantages do you have in mind when you said there are certain specific advantages that they see in getting involved in this conflict? Well, uh, getting the, the gratif gratitude of the United States or uh, well, they deny that they have any territorial ambitions, although they say we had historical ambitions, a role, but and so on. But I cannot see that uh, this would be permitted. The war is not for the purpose of dissecting Iraq. The war is to get the liber Kuwait liberated. Why did you mention dissection of Iraq? Is because that the press is full of it. You know, there are people who say that, but I don't think that this should be permitted to be anybody's objective. Well, this war, if you notice, has created a strange harmony. You've got Saudi Arabia and Israel on the same side, and there's you and, the, uh, and Turkey on the same side. Um, there is a great, uh, this conflict has, is turning out to be a great equalizer, it seems to me. Well, uh, you could say that, but I don't think uh, that, as I said to you before, that we are really on this, speaking the same language, because if we were speaking the same language, which I hope we would be speaking the same language with Turkey, then uh, Turkey would not have been so intransigent on its attitude to Cyprus and the problem of Cyprus. But unfortunately, they are. So I think it's more a question of convenience uh, in terms of how they see their interests. But I repeat that I would be extremely happy to see Turkey do that, to speak on moral grounds, because uh, uh, I do not want to see Turkey as an opponent. I want to see Turkey, we are a small country, Cyprus is a small country, and uh, we want to, to live with Turkey in peace and cooperation. But uh, because you are an Indian and because you can understand uh, the parallel, uh, you have Sri Lanka and, uh, and uh, you have the Tamils, uh, and they had a problem. Let's not go into details of that. But the fact is that at some moment, India, at the invitation of the Sri Lankan government, went in not to help Sri Lanka to be cut off in two, in two with the peace going to the Tamils and the peace going to the uh, Sinhalese, but uh, in order to help safeguard the integrity, the territorial integrity of, uh, of Sri Lanka. Uh, in our case, it was exactly the opposite. Not at our invitation, Turkey came in, not in order to safeguard, as they said, the constitutional integrity of the country, because, uh, but uh, on the contrary, in order to establish, in essence, a partition on the island. And they insist on staying in, uh, despite the relevant UN resolutions and so on, while the Indians, when uh, the Indian government, when the Sh Sri Lanka government at some moment said, well, we think that we thank you for what you've done and we think you should depart, uh, they did depart. So uh, I think that uh, the behavior of, of countries uh, should be modeled on what India did. If they are needed, they help and they go, but they behave in that sense. Uh, unfortunately, Turkey behaved in exactly the opposite way. And uh, the only thing I can say is that I hope they will realize at some stage that on these bases, uh, the world cannot function. And uh, whatever short-term benefits there are, the long-term negative effects are many, much, much bigger. You know, coming from this war zone, when I land in Larnaca and I come to Nicosia, and I see Mahatma Gandhi's statue and Indira Gandhi Road, I sometimes reflect whether it is not a relic of the past, a kind of nostalgia, uh, because Makarios is gone and Nehru is gone, and I get the feeling that non-aligned countries are getting involved in their own individual problems. Do you agree with that? Well, let's put it like that. Problems are getting more serious. And uh, it's obvious that governments spend more time in dealing with their own internal problems because also the demands of people grow and uh, therefore uh, there are bigger demands, bigger needs to be met 
bigger problems to be addressed. But I think at the same time, uh, people realize that there is a bigger need for cooperation. And in that sense, I think that uh, the relations between India and Cyprus are now stronger than ha they have ever been before. Because in the days of Makarios, it was an affection between Makarios and Nehru, something we all respected and liked. Today, in addition to the good relations that there exist between uh, me and the political leadership of India, uh, there is uh, a growing relationship on economic level. Uh, Indian companies have received for the first time a very big contract in Cyprus. We are working on a project to which aims at uh, establishing a central depot here in Cyprus to be used as a depot for the re-export of Indian goods. And this is a project that started with Rajiv but continued with uh, uh, Prime Minister Singh and uh, I continues with the present uh, government and because it's a project that aims at benefiting India and Cyprus and not a specific government. And therefore, uh, the relations are growing and it is our intention to make them stronger. British bases remain in Cyprus. Yes. And they are probably being used in the present operation. No, they are not done. used. They are basically logistical bases, logistic bases. They have no active role in the controversy, in the war. Why are they there then? Oh, they are there for other reasons. <laughs> they were there forever, but uh, they had other reasons. But in the case of this conflict, they are not being used. It was a condition of independence. They're, they are sovereign bases. This is what was imposed on Cyprus when it was done. And unless we want to go to war with the United Kingdom, <laughs> uh, we have to respect the, the, the Treaty of Establishment which, uh, on which the Cyprus Republic was established and which clearly said that the bases are, are there. But we look forward to the day when the bases will become obsolete uh, not as a result of uh, simply of our desire or not, but as a result of the developments in the world when right. bases will not be necessary. Walking around Nicosia, Mr. President, we went to this observation tower on the 11th floor. We were talking to people and we were talking to some soldiers and they... And I got the impression that their reaction to the war was somewhat out of sync, out of harmony with the official position having been taken by the government of Cyprus? No, there isn't. But simply, there is a fact that people feel that uh, uh, because uh, the Cyprus, uh, when the invasion of Cyprus uh, took place, there was not a proper reaction and so on, people feel bitter about it. Mm. But what is more important is not how bitter we are about the past, but how we envision the future. Is there anything that a country like India uh, do in the present conflict that's going on in your neighborhood, in your vicinity, in the Gulf? Is there any initiative? Is there any initiative that is alive that you are aware of? I don't think we should think in terms of initiatives, but I think that India, a country like India with its tremendous moral power and, uh, and, and importance as a country can play a role in helping to both bring this conflict to an end, but more important in that sense is not just to bring the conflict to an end because the conflict will come to an end, if not in a week or two weeks or a month, but anyway, it's not a conflict that will last forever. It's much more important to see international law <coughs> applied after that. And that's what we must all strive for, and in that sense, uh, India has a very big role to play.